One day, but run this city. I have a habit of looking for uh, good ideas in any place I can find them. Uh, magazines, newspapers, television, bookstores, and I was in a bookstore. And I was in the uh, discount rack where you spin around the rack, and there was a book uh, with no cover. And I just looked at it, and it just told what the one line, you know, the concept of the book, and the flyleaf, and I picked it up and called the publisher and asked for subsidiary rights. And uh, I was able to option the book with my own funds, as slim as they were. Larry Gordon showed me the book, and he had asked me if I'd at some time in the future, vague future, be interested in it. And I, I certainly said yes. I, I thought that it lent itself to a very pure chase kind of atmosphere. So I think the immediate attraction was the kind of purity and simplicity. The book itself, Saul Yurick's novel, is an earnest sociological story of gangs, this downtrodden people who were forced into delinquency b because of their uh, deprived status in, in life. It's based on Greek history. Uh, Xenophon was a Greek general, and this takes place right after the war between Athens and Sparta. And he was part of a mercenary army that had gone into the old Persian Empire which was having a struggle for power between several rival factions for the throne. And uh, they found themselves, after a huge battle, isolated, alone, uh, several thousand miles from the sea. And this mercenary Greek army always felt that if they could get back to the sea, they could then get home and they were surrounded and they had to fight their way or make alliances by hook or crook and by trick or treat. And the famous uh, moment in Xenophon's Anabasis is where the sea appears before them, where they realize they've made it. Larry had the script developed by David Shaver. I very much liked the idea. And I remember saying to him, but nobody will ever let us do this. This doesn't lend itself to name actors or anything like that and uh, probably the studios wouldn't go for something like this. I had done Hard Times and The Driver with Walter. We were trying to put together a, a, a script that we still own and, and still talk about doing called uh, Last Gun. We got the Western set up and we were getting ready to shoot it. I think we were about eight weeks away from shooting and the financial backing pulled out and left us high and dry. So uh, Larry said, I think I might have a window at Paramount if you're still interested in doing the Warriors, but we'd have to go right away. And I said, fine, if, if you can put it together, let's do it. And it came together very, very quickly. I don't think I had made my leap yet into the comic book sensibility of the piece. As a matter of fact, I think the, the film is almost only explicable in comic book terms, the kind of uh, mixture of jeopardy. In many ways, there's a kind of good feeling about the movie to uh, almost silliness, um, but that was the intention. At the very beginning, I said, look, to do this properly and to do the vision of the novel, it really only makes sense if you do it all black and Hispanic and the studio was not very keen on that idea. And uh, I later came to realize that the studio kind of forced me into the comic book idea, I think, because it was about the only way I could make it all make sense to myself. You had to create a different kind of reality. Riff! Yeah! Right! Who are the warriors? You had an unusual problem in trying to cast the Warriors because you had to have people, not only did they have to have hopefully an interesting look and the ability to read a line and et cetera, but they had to be physical enough to kind of take what I knew I was gonna put them through. I mean, this, this was a 
very tough physical movie where they were going to do a tremendous amount of running. There was always the thought to do it you know, with unknowns, and uh, let me put it this way, there were thousands, it seemed, of unknown actors, kids wanting to be actors and whatever, coming in uh, to see us. You know, we just, we just kept looking until we found the best people. If you get separated, make it to the platform at Union Square. That's where we change trains. I had done an independent film called Madman that was shot in Israel. Walter Hill was one of the producers of Alien, and Sigourney Weaver was also in this movie that I had done in Israel called Madman. They screened the movie to look at Sigourney to, you know, consider her for the lead that she ended up playing in Alien, and Walter, I guess, liked my performance enough in, in that picture to have me come in and, and, and talk to him about uh, the role in the, in the Warriors. Specifically, I remember meeting with Walter and, and Larry Gordon, the producer. When I met him and all that, I thought, no, I think we can pull this off. Uh, but I did. I saw him in a, a movie that had been made in Israel. I thought he had a, a, an interesting quality. I only got one question. Who named you leader? Frank Marshall, Larry Gordon, Walter Hill, we're seated around this huge conference table, and I read the scene from the uh, from the park where I get handcuffed to the bench. Oh, you don't get it. I like it rough. The part was written for a nine foot tall guy, and I'm five ten. I just I had to make this guy big, so I grabbed a hold of the corner of this huge conference table, making like it was the bench, and uh, handcuffed myself to it, anchored myself, and I really just played against it and got very enraged with this 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 whole situation and in the middle of the 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 reading I, I i really pulled on thing and lifted the whole corner of this conference table up that weighed hundreds of pounds i was i was quite strong at the time i remember when he auditioned he just came in and we were in a big room with this huge table and we all sat across and he got so wound up in his reading that he reached down and he picked up the whole end of the table and lifted it up and i was i'm very impressed with that Walter went, whoa, <laughs> and the story I'm told later is that I, I had to give him the job. He, he picked the fucking table up. From the first time he read, I knew he was going to be the guy that I'd want. Cyrus is right about one thing. It's all out there. Walt had already seen every actor in New York City, and he didn't cast his part. It was the last part that he did not cast, and I walked in there, sat and met with Walter, and after five minutes, Walter kind of, you know, wanted to kind of looks at you and talks like this a little bit, and he does this a lot, and he uh, looks at you, and he said, oh, okay, Harris, uh, I'll see you soon. <laughs> you know? And I walked out, and I remember I just ran down the stairs, got off the elevator, and ran out of the building. Couldn't wait to get the first public phone to call my agent. Jackie, I, 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 I think, I think, <laughs> and she's like, David, calm down. David, calm down. Next day, she called me back. She said, David, you're in the worst. How come you're so happy about this? I'm having a good time. That was my first film, The Warriors, my debut. Walter Hill and Larry Gordon saw me in a Broadway play called Working. And I did a monologue in that play about a hippie who espoused peace and love, but was actually extremely passive aggressive and he sang and played the guitar and he played very positive guys and I, somehow when I saw it I thought this guy would make a great villain that rang some bells for those guys and they just saw that that would be something useful for Luther I looked right for the part I had this long long hair that I wanted to cut but I had to keep for that part in working and they decided it was right for this too he was obviously a very good actor and he's got a kind of Richard III kind of quality. Walter described it as Richard III, which hit the bullseye for me, and that's the kind of energy that I tried to bring to it. You know what that is, don't you? Yeah, trouble. Deborah occupies, obviously, the most screen time of any female presence in the movie. She's a very strong actress, and her character probably has the greatest transition and attitude of, of anybody within the film. She pulled it off, I thought, with enormous style. She's quite theatrical. I was doing theater, and I had done Hair on Broadway, the revival of Hair. That was my first professional job. 
got an agent from that, and then you just start pounding the pavement looking for work, and this project came along. I got the impression we kind of had to push them to see me. And my boyfriend at the time, I'm smiling because he was kind of discouraging me because he thought that they were going to be looking for someone a little more well-endowed, among other things. And my agent was sweet. He said, you are so well-endowed. I went in, I had a few auditions, and it was really scary. I was reading with various people, and sometimes it went well, sometimes it didn't. Ultimately, what I remember Walter saying when I was chosen, he said, you were the unobvious choice. And I really appreciated that. We're gonna go for it. It was a delicate balance that Walter was looking for. We cast it totally out of New York. We didn't bring anybody in from the outside. We really wanted to feel like the movie was New York based. We wanted it to be true to New York and true to the kind of kids that were there at that time. We had a wonderful costume designer, Bobby Mannix. I think actually the first real breakthrough for me on the movie in prep was dealing with Bobby and that every time she would bring something in that was kind of strange, I would not only encourage her, I would encourage her to go further with it. This is a gang picture and I, 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 I'm not from any neighborhood that had any gangs. I would not know a gang from, from Adam, not at all. I was handed a list of all these wonderful names of gangs that Walter created. And then I just went from there and then I separate everything by color or characters by color. And then I just fantasize and come up with these ideas. I just do. I painted the patches different colors. The woman that did all this embroidery, very, very famous woman from England named Rose Clements, who did all this stuff by hand. And she was incredible. I had to separate each individual warrior, and each one of them had a different name, of course, and their names, their own personality, you mix it up, you come out with an individual. It was kind of Bobby and I kicking it back and forth that um, put that stuff together. If you can supply a direction, the collaboration of very talented people on a motion picture, uh, there's no end that they can help you and the look and the style of the picture is very much attributable to Bobby as well as a number of others. In doing my research, uh, I actually, I went to Coney Island and you know, I'm walking up and down the boardwalk and there's a tough looking guy working a concession, a ball toss or something, and there's nobody there. And I, I tossed a few balls and I talked with him and I, and I just asked him, I said, what kind of people hang around here? What kind of people come from here? And he puts his arms back and he smiles and he says, the worst kind. <laughs> I'll tell you a story about the Warriors, which set the tone for the Warriors as far as I was concerned. I was standing next to Walter and I looked way down the boardwalk and there was one of our PAs talking to a very big man who was in kind of raggedy clothes. And our little PA was standing in front of him. I just saw him brush this PA aside. And the PA got back in front of him again. He was trying to stop him walking into our shot. And he started talking very loud, and we just stood there. And the guy finally cleared out of the way, and we proceeded. But I said, uh-oh, this is not going to be easy. This is going to be tough. This is New York. Welcome to New York. 